The number seven is a big deal in the Bible. Yeah, in biblical Hebrew, the word seven is connected to the idea of fullness or completeness. And that's something we all long for, but don't often experience. Instead, we find ourselves working endlessly, fighting back chaos with no real rest. Yes. Now keep all that in mind as we turn to Genesis 1 in the Bible. It begins with darkness and disorder, but then God speaks to bring about light and order so that life can flourish. And this happens over the course of six days. Each day is marked with the phrase, there was evening and there was morning. But on the seventh day, something special happens. God stops and rests. Right. Creation is brought to its completion on the seventh day. And that phrase, there was evening and there was morning, it doesn't appear on day seven. It's like a day with no end. On the seventh day, God's presence fills his creation. The land provides for all of God's creatures, including humans who are appointed to rule the world with God forever. Kings and queens of the seventh day rest. I can get into that. But the humans are deceived by a dark power and they forfeit that rest. They're exiled into the wilderness where they have to work as slaves to the land. Until they die and return to the dust from which they came. But God wants to restore humanity back to that seventh day rest. So he chooses to give the family of Israel that experience of ultimate rest so they can share it with others. But how? They're in Egypt, slaves to an oppressive empire who's grinding them into the dust. So God confronts Egypt and he liberates the Israelites, taking them through the darkness and chaos on the way to the promised land. Now, while they're on their way, they find themselves in the wilderness. It's easy to get lost, life is a struggle, they're not in the land of rest yet. But while they're on the way, God invites them in the wilderness to start living as if they're in the promised land. But how do you practice the future rest in the wilderness? Well, God tells them that every seventh day they are to stop their work, or in Hebrew, to Shabbat, so that they can rest and enjoy God's good world. So take a whole day to live as if the ultimate rest has already come. Yeah, this is the Sabbath, celebrated every week on the seventh day. But there's more. The Sabbath is just one of seven festivals that Israel practiced every year, each one anticipating that seventh day rest. That is a lot of sevens. And there's even more. Every seven years, the Israelites were to liberate slaves, forgive debts, and let the land rest for a whole year. And then every seven times seven years was the ultimate seventh day rest called the year of Jubilee. If anyone had lost their land or gone into debt, all was forgiven, everything restored. Wow, so the Sabbath, these feasts, the year of Jubilee, it's all pointing towards the hope of future rest. Right. Now, when the Israelites went into the land, they forgot their God, and so they forfeited their chance for rest in the promised land. They're exiled and enslaved again by an oppressive nation, led back into a world of chaos and disorder. But Israel's prophets said that their exile would end one day and that the ultimate jubilee of freedom and rest would come, but generations go by and they're still waiting. It's at this dark point in the story that Jesus appears and he launches his public mission on a Sabbath day. Yeah, he read aloud from the scroll of Isaiah saying that it was time for all captives and slaves to be released because this was the year of the Lord's favor. What did he mean, this is the year of the Lord's favor? He was talking about the ultimate jubilee. Also, Jesus is claiming that seventh day rest would come through him. Right, he said that he was the Lord of the Sabbath and he confronted disorder and darkness and all of its forms, liberating people from sickness, sin, even from death itself. Yet, Jesus was killed, so even his work was undone. Well, it seemed that way. But notice, Jesus timed his death to take place at the end of the week. His body rested in a tomb during the Sabbath and on the eighth day, he rose from the dead. Oh wait, the eighth day? You mean the first day of a new week? Exactly. Jesus' resurrection was like the first day of a new creation, where God's light and life broke into the darkness. So because of the resurrection, we have hope in God's promise of future rest. But we're not there yet. It's like we're still in the wilderness, where we experience struggle and pain. But as we journey towards that ultimate seventh day, Jesus invites us to experience a taste of real rest now by following him, or in his words, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest.
Hello, I'm Danielle Pavic, the Associate National Director of Pastoral Health for the Vineyard. It is a pleasure to have you join me today as we explore our work and our rest, rest rhythms. Um, don't you love that video that we just saw, saw? Thank you so much, Bible Project, for putting together some really creative and beautiful videos that we can use. Well, I've been a pastor for about 20 years, and this might be one of the common things, like this topic that we're doing for this webinar, one of the common things that I'm asked about, like, how do you do everything? Like be a ministry leader and be a boss, a neighbor, a wife, a mom. I mean, all the things, all the roles that we carry. And I can't tell you how many times I want to respond right back. Like, how do you know that I do it all? That's such an assumption. No, I have spent most of my life feeling inadequate and slightly overwhelmed with the responsibilities of life. And that is both personal and professional. Now, certain seasons of life have made that feeling of overwhelmness intensify or even get better to where you feel like you have a little bit more room to be able to live life and do all the things that you're supposed to do. But even as I confess all this, I know that I'm not alone. There's a reason that you signed up for this webinar. Um, all the talked about stats right now, all the national stats that are coming out, they're dire and they are sobering. We've got more men and women leaving pastoral ministry than entering it. And that is because of burnout and being very, very overwhelmed with the asks. Barna's latest stat is that 38% of all pastors consider themselves burned out and are considering currently quitting what they are doing. The Center for Transforming Engagement out of Seattle, they put out a report in 2022 about clergy burnout saying congregations expect that pastors should be good at every part of their job. Now, those jobs that we have, they can include up to 64 task clusters or 13 different roles. I mean, everything from like janitorial work to preaching to leading staff. I mean, all the stuff, youth work, worship, worship pastors, no matter or excuse me, like no wonder, like many of us, you and me, we start to feel an exhaustion and a cynicism, a weariness for life. We start to feel really distant from the relationships that mean the most important things to us. It's just because we literally don't have energy. Well, today, over the next few minutes, the rest of our time together, I want to explore how we work as pastors and ministry leaders and present an idea that there might be a more freeing kind of framework for the way that we set up our days and the way that we move throughout all the tasks and all the jobs that come at us. I also want to explore the rhythm of rest and how critical it is for us to pull back really hard from work to engage in rest. This is where we are gonna explore the gift of Sabbath. It is one of the most precious practices I've ever engaged with in my own spiritual journey. And it's been very, very challenging. I have to be very honest with you, very challenging, but incredibly life-giving over time. It's one of those things that I wish that somebody would have talked to me about early on in my ministry life, but I didn't learn about it until I was more in my mid like 30s, maybe early to mid 30s. So with that specific part of the conversation, I've invited my friend of 25 years, fellow vineyard pastor, national team member, um, Rob Morgan, to dialogue and do a little back and forth about those back and forth rhythms of rest. Oh, you can go and wave there, okay, about work and rest. Now, we've received a few questions that we're going to be hopefully answering throughout our time, but at the end, we are going to have an optional Q&A session. So if there's anything that you want to find out a little bit more go ahead and send in those questions. And I'm also gonna be providing some resources that you can take and you can keep on learning after this webinar. You can read, you can explore, you can watch a little bit more about these videos. But let me just say right now, I just have to go ahead and just say very, very clearly, I'm not an expert. Rob is not an expert. We are just gonna lower, we're gonna lower the expectations. The one thing that I can say is that we are very convicted about this. And we are really trying with all the different things that are coming at us. And by the grace of God, we're trying to figure this out. Right, Rob? Yes, yes. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to we say were something? Actually, well, we were actually, what, at a, a backyard barbecue two weeks ago or something. And this was the, this was the substance of our conversation with, with yes. one another and a few other people involved. Yes. And, um, so much fruit from that uh, discussion and from the practice of rest and Sabbath in particular. Yes. 
Yes. And there is something so fun about being able to talk about it with other people and be able to get ideas, feel affirmed, exhort, encourage, isn't it? So yes. hopefully that's good. That's what we're going to do today. So, but let's go ahead and start off with this work portion. Let's talk a little bit more about this. I've got um, a brief portion of a video from a creative. It's fun. I'm loving those videos of like drawings. And, you know, I just feel like it kind of captures a little bit more about our imagination. It's based off of a concept of energy. Um, it's, it's from a book called The Power of Full Engagement. It is literally a book that changed everything for me in the way that I actually thought about my life. Um, it's not written as a spiritual book. It's more of like a business book, um, but super easy read. But the spiritual implications in this content, they're very real. So let's go ahead and watch together. And then we're going to talk through a few specifics, thinking very intentionally about our own context and the roles that we inhabit um, currently, like right now. So let's go ahead and watch together. By the time we reach adulthood and come face to face with the full complexities of life, balancing out career aspirations and a family life and a social life, and hopefully also a healthy internal life, when we get to that stage of adulthood and those full levels of responsibility, we've already been through years of training around managing our time from experiences in early education through to high school and college. Time strict schedules have marked the path for us. But what if managing your time wasn't the best way to actually perform well at work and show up in the way that you would like to in your personal life? The authors of the book, The Power of Full Engagement, Jim Lohr and Tony Schwartz, argue that it's actually energy, not time, that's the fundamental currency of high performance. And in this video, I'm going to share a visual summary of some of the key ideas from that book because I've found them to be incredibly impactful and they've shifted the way that I approach my life and the decisions that I make each day. One of the first things they point out about time compared to energy is that time is a fixed quantity. There's only so much of it every day. Energy, on the other hand, is not fixed. The amount of energy that you have during any specific period of time is totally dependent on a whole variety of conditions. And the overall argument of this book is that it's worth it to pay more attention to your energy than it is to pay attention to time and specific schedules. Because that focus on time comes from a machine-centered way of viewing the world and of viewing the human experience in it. That machine-centered approach is all about the optimization of technology and equipment. But we humans are not machines, and thinking of ourselves as one isn't that helpful. So instead, this focus on energy comes from a human-centered point of view, where the goal here is the optimization of alertness and performance, emphasizing again that it's not necessarily the amount of time that you devote to any particular task, it's the quality of the energy that you give to that task. And as I'm sure you can imagine, whether you're thinking about time spent with family or time spent on a work project, even just 20 minutes of high quality energy does a ton more good than an hour or two of very low energy toward that task. That machine-centered approach reminds me of some ideas that I read about in Cal Newport's book, Digital Minimalism, which I explored in another video. In that book, Newport contrasts digital minimalism to digital maximalism, where the idea is to adopt any new technology that provides even the smallest benefit, disregarding the potentially huge cost that might come along with the adoption of that technology. That digital maximalist or machine-centered approach has the potential to lead us astray from what's actually the most helpful for us. Searching for the best productivity app might take you in the wrong direction. Rather than seeking out that external technological tool, better to turn inward and pay more attention to the energy that you're bringing to the work in front of you. So the goal of this book then is to help us bring our best energy to the various things we spend our time on each day. And what I found to be helpful here are the four categories of energy that the authors choose to focus on. The first is physical, with the ideal state being physically energized. Then there's emotional energy, with the goal of feeling emotionally connected. 
Then we've got mental energy with the ideal state being mentally focused. And last but not least, spiritual energy with the ideal state being when our actions are in alignment with our deepest values. Now, of course, these different categories of energy aren't independent of each other. They are very much connected, but the authors point out that generally we tend to be overtrained, overextended when it comes to the mental energy and emotional energy that we expend each day, often in the service of getting more done quicker, and we tend to neglect our physical energy and our spiritual energy. And as you'll see in a few minutes here, the authors devote a full chapter to each of these types of energy. But first, let's take a deeper look into how these authors think about energy in general, and then we'll apply it to these specific areas. So there's one main idea that the authors hammer home time and time again throughout this book, and that's the importance of this cycle of expending energy and then giving yourself time to recover energy before you go expend more of it. That cycle is what we as human beings need in order to continue performing well. And they point out that if you manage that cycle well, you can actually expand your capacity for work, your capacity to expend energy in any one of those four categories that we just mentioned. So here that's like increasing the size of your battery. In order to increase that size, you first have to expend energy past your current limits, but then equally important is giving yourself the opportunity to recover. Without that recovery period, your battery doesn't grow, you just burn out. On the flip side of that, if you don't expend energy within one of those given categories, your battery will contract. Your tank of physical energy, for example, or your tank of spiritual energy will be smaller because of its lack of use. So what I find helpful about this overall framework is that it encourages you to have this balance of expending energy and recovering energy across those four categories. That's what will lead to a fully engaged life, which is one of the ways I define success in my life. And here they encourage you to think about your energy use throughout the day as oscillating with peaks and valleys, times when you're working hard in a given area, other times when you're resting. That oscillation stands in pretty stark contrast to a linear view of energy expenditure, which I feel like often is at the core of a bunch of productivity systems or time management systems. The assumption that within every single block of 30 minutes from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., you'll be able to bring the same amount of energy. That's just not how humans work. So as you think about and plan out your days, you should plan for that oscillation in energy, not for a steady state of it. And it's with the idea of planning for that oscillation that rituals come in. Some rituals that focus on the exercise piece, the expenditure of energy, other rituals that focus on the recovery side. It's the balance of those two types of rituals throughout your day that will help you maximize the quality of energy, the quality of attention that you're able to bring to each task, each interaction, each thing that you encounter throughout the day. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about this book is how many examples of those rituals that they provide. You get these snapshots of real people that the authors worked with and the specific challenges that they had and the rituals that they built into their days to address those challenges and kind of balance out those energies. Add some exercise in the categories that were lacking, add some recovery in those that were overextended. Okay, so good little video. Um, I think that that says a lot in just a few different minutes. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do as you're watching this, um, if you have a piece of paper nearby or you want to grab your phone, make a few little notes, we're going to do a little bit of an exercise because we're going to look at the four different types or buckets of energy that this concept is talking about. And we're going to look at the expenditure of that energy and then how to refill it. And my hunch would be, um, even as I was preparing this, my hunch would be that there's going to be one of these buckets, if not even a couple of these buckets that you go, mm, there's some work to be done here. I can tell that with my own current context or the things that I'm interacting with right now, there's some things that God is actually talking to me about as a pastor, as a ministry leader, even as like a mom, a dad, I mean, all of this stuff. So, so I want us to really kind of work this material just for a few minutes before we start talking about rest. Um, now, the very beginning part of that video, there is a line in there that literally made me want to yell 
like glory hallelujah I said we are not machines okay but the thing is is that we treat ourselves like machines don't we and we treat other people like they're machines like that they can just start cramming in all these different things and not have like real reactions to to uh expanding energy um so four buckets of energy number one and this is one of the ones that um, are oftentimes neglected. I see that just through my experience, but it is the physical energy, physical energy bucket. This is the most core of all of our energies. This is, this is when you wake up in the morning after a good night's sleep and you just feel rested. You feel ready to take on the day. You have energy to plan. You have energy to exercise. You just, it, it, it's, it's working really good. Now, that only happens if you are investing in your body. If you are not sleeping or not eating regularly or well, if you neglect going to the doctor for, for medical things that are kind of nagging at you and sapping that energy, if you don't have even like a good kind of rhythm of exercise, it's very irregular, maybe it doesn't happen at all, or even the most base um, kind of practice of just breathing well, you know, taking time to just get deep breaths and, and calming ourselves well, that means that you are neglecting this core energy bucket. I know so many people that wake up and they just immediately start drinking coffee. I am completely, well, yeah, that's me. I'm talking about myself right now. Drinking coffee to like get myself through like my morning. I do have my limit of noon, okay? But then oftentimes people will kind of move into, yes, and now we're gonna calm down and we're gonna drink our wine and beer at night, you know? It's just a thinking through, like, how do you get through the day? How do you manipulate that energy? And that's not really a great way to be able to do that because that means that we're not optimally, optimally like showing up for life. So I had a week like this last week where my energy was very, very low. I was traveling. I was speaking somewhere. I was spending a lot of time talking with people. I was visiting with family. And there were a few moments where I had to admit, didn't I, Rob? I actually feel like I had a conversation with you where I'm like, my physical energy is very, very low. I actually developed a congestion, a cough, and I recognized that I needed to pull back a little bit in order to kind of restore that fitness physical energy. So if that's, if that's something that's kind of hitting you right now, I just want you to take a brief moment as we move forward. How is your physical energy bucket? How's that working for you? And are there ways that you know immediately like, yeah, I actually do need to value this and tend to a few things. Okay. Now, listen, this is all homework. Okay. So we're going to move kind of quickly through this, but I want you to, to go ahead and just write this down for now. So emotional energy, number two, this is the way that we're relating to other human beings. This is the way that you feel empathetic. You feel connected. This is really how confident and how self-assured that you feel. Now we can find this reservoir being depleted when we experience too many negative emotions for a sustained amount of time. So it's not just one day, you know, of just having some bad meetings, but this is like over a sustained amount of time where it just starts to accumulate in us and we're not experiencing more positive emotions. Um, now, this is really hard as I'm talking to pastors and ministry leaders because we do ministry for a living. And if somebody would have told me 21 years ago that we would deal with so much crisis, and so many kind of negative things as we're interacting with people and telling them about Jesus and bringing peace to their lives, I would have looked at them and been like, I don't even know if I want to do this. Like, this is crazy. Like, this is ministry is a hard profession. It's a very difficult profession. I'm sure you guys have no idea what I'm talking about, right? Like, this is just me, right? This is just me, not even Rob. Okay. So we fill up this reservoir by engaging in life-giving activities. Life-giving activities that bring joy and a lightheartedness to life that connect us to like how we are made. We fill this as well as we grow in our own healing journeys. And as we just get more emotionally healthy, that we're not just taking on all these negative emotions all the time. So again, I want you to pause. This is very brief, but I want you to pause for a moment and just think about your own life. Like how is the emotional energy reservoir working right now? and be completely honest, nobody's gonna look at your little piece of paper right now. Okay, number three, mental energy. This is the way that we focus in on learning and solving problems. This is the way that we are creative and the way that our mind is stimulated. 
God made us with these gorgeous minds that can oftentimes get really overloaded with the amount of stuff that we are taking in and that we are thinking and processing about. And also just not allowing time to rest and to be able to release our minds from the pressure of all this kind of overworking and thinking. Now, have you ever had moments where you just know that you're just not as sharp? You know, you just, you've got too many things that you're thinking about. You've got too many projects that you're working on, too many, too many pastoral situations that you're involved in that you're really trying to intentionally think through. And then maybe on the flip side, maybe after a good night's sleep and you, you, you have some type of practice where you kind of release things, you're on fire. You can focus, you can concentrate. You are just creative with the way that you think. Mental energy is so incredibly important to think about the way that we are stewarding this incredible kind of reservoir of mental energy. So again, let's pause for a moment and then we're going to get to the spiritual, spiritual energy piece, but let's just pause for a moment. How is this working for you? And then the fourth piece, spiritual energy. This is the soul energy of your connection with God. The book does not ref like refer to spiritual energy as specifically your connection with God. We know that that is. Um, the way that I do like it being described as well is that this is also your place of not only just practice and connection, but it's also about your belief system your integrity, your value system. These are those deep places inside of you that we have to be clear about. And we have to make sure that everything that we are saying yes to and no to line up with this belief system that we've given a ton of work to be able to figure out. Our spiritual energy, it becomes depleted as we are out of alignment with these kind of core places of our soul. Um, spiritual energy is refilled when we engage in different practices and rhythms that help guard that kind of precious connection with God um, and yourself and others, okay? So it's not just about God, but it's, it's keeping very true to the things that God has actually talked to you about, your calling, how confident you feel in your roles and the jobs that you take on. So one of the biggest reasons of burnout for pastors is, is that they lose sight of how important this spiritual energy reservoir is for them themselves. It's because we take on looking at other people, figuring out their own lives, becoming incredibly kind of, you know, involved. And I mean, at times even codependent, trying to figure out other people's spiritual reservoirs and neglecting our own. So again, I'm sure that you have no idea what I'm talking about. It's just me, right? <laughs> so I want us to take just a minute and I want us to think about our own spiritual reservoirs. Again, along with the physical reservoir in piece, the energy piece, the spiritual one is probably the most neglected. So it's going to be physical and spiritual. The energy and the in the mental and the kind of emotional piece, those are the ones that are amped oftentimes like the most. Rob, what do you think about that? Like, do you agree uh, with that? Do you feel resistance to that? Like, give me a little bit of your thoughts about this. No, I think in concept, kind of shifting the idea of time and energy and looking at this through the, yeah, the concept of energy is incredibly important. Um, I sort of am referred to as like a systems guy within our movement. And so it's not uncommon for pastors to reach out to me and say, Hey, can you help me think through my schedule or time management? Mm -hmm. um, and I think oftentimes work rest, that conversation is associated with time management. But even as the video alludes to time management mm -hmm. uh, is driven by the question, how can I be productive? Or maybe for some on the call yes. or some who will hear this, how can I be more productive? Um, how can I do more? How can I squeeze more into my day? And it becomes about that mm -hmm. mechanistic machine driven time thing. But I think a more important question, which this video alludes to without having kind of the biblical foundation is how do I flourish? How mm -hmm. I've been, been designed by God to yeah. thrive and then, you know, flourishing in, in their definition is connected, energized, focused, and in alignment with values. And if we live from that place, understanding our energy reservoirs, um, I, I think it's a wonderful kind of reframing of some of the challenges that people have, because I think we might start with the wrong question initially. So I think yes. the flourishing concept is a more helpful way. And it invites me to mm -hmm. think about how I'm relating to the world and to others uh, and how mm -hmm. I've been designed to thrive in the areas of responsibility. And you mentioned stewardship as well. How am I stewarding um, those reservoirs in relationship to my marriage, my ministry responsibilities, my personal health and well-being. So I, I love the concept. And I think that that energy 
is, is a more helpful way to, to, to frame the discussion. Now, have you seen over the course of your ministry life, like where you have been even confronted with how important this is? <laughs> like oh, have there absolutely. been any moments? Yeah, give me give me some some real life examples because um I want to talk real here because I want to take it from theoretical to real life. Like, how does this work with a ministry with so much on our plates? Um, can you think of a time where this became very real for you? Oh, sure. I mean, it's as simple as for most of my uh, young adult, early ad kind of 20s and 30s, even before that, I was never a good sleeper. Um, I didn't feel like I needed much sleep. I usually pressed into the you know 1 a.m., 2 a.m., um, could kind of just grind out a, a hard work day based on discipline and effort. Mm -hmm. And a number of years ago, um, I just began really asking the Lord to speak to me about sleep and about rest. Um, and, you know, there's a simple passage in the scriptures that said the Lord gives sleep to those who he loves, yeah. um, that he gives it as a gift. And I just said, I don't think I've ever received the gift of sleep. So I just began praying, Lord, would you give me the gift of sleep? And over time, yeah. and then paying attention to what would be required of me to receive the yeah. gift, um, using technology late into the evenings, having my phone with me, you know, as I go to bed, just different things that I had to decide, how will I par partner with the Lord? I've seen my sleep patterns change. I've paid attention to food in relationship to how it impacts my body mm -hmm. and understanding um, what is depleting, uh, what sometimes even affects me negatively. Um, I walk a lot. So there's some of the physical side. Mm -hmm. um, I've also formed what I would say are guiding principles, which have helped me stay engaged to um, the spiritual energy, like what has kept me connected. And so I have some things that I can kind of coach myself into in anxious moments that bring yeah. a peace and a confidence to show up a certain way. Um, and then more recently, uh, I've committed to gardening and being in the soil. Uh, I felt like the Lord a few years invited me to put my hands in the soil and actually kind of touch and engage the, the rhythms of creation around planting and harvesting yeah. and, 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 and weeding and, uh, you know, kind of tending to something. So there's been a number yes. of things that have been a part of that process and they've been incremental yeah. as I've sort of asked the question, what's my responsibility to steward the invitation to flourish? Yes. I remember a time that's probably, probably now about six years ago, I was sitting at a stoplight and I zoned out so much so that I literally forgot where I was going, <laughs> what I was doing. And it was one of those moments where, you know, I just kind of was like, oh, that was kind of strange. And then I noticed that every meeting that I was in, I was thinking about something different, you know, because it was that feeling of like I'm yeah. behind or I've got a big to do or, and I wasn't giving people the attention and the time that they really deserved as a pastor. Um, and that coincided with not being able to sleep and that sort of thing. And that was a huge wake up call for me. It was right before I advocated um, for a sabbatical rest, like a longer mm -hmm. rest. Cause I'm like, something's not working right. Like these, I'm becoming so depleted. I'm not showing up in my best self. Um, and it's not only just hurting me, but it's hurting all the people around me that I can't again, steward or control or, or just even manage like what's happening. Um, I stepped into a sabbatical period of a few months, which maybe some of you have experienced and some maybe are even thinking about. Um, and it was very interesting because again, I had to turn my way of thinking like, how am I going to, what am I going to do? What am I going to do during this time, you know, to how do I actually fill these reservoirs up again? Mm -hmm. It's really interesting that you mentioned like digging in the soil, because that was something I, I found myself like really slowing down to the, to the extent like where I'm like planting things in my yard. I would sit in my backyard and just stare. And I'm like, and I realized I had not given myself just the time to just be and be quiet and have solitude. And, yeah. and there was a real reworking of that. So anyways, I, I just, I, hopefully this is helpful for those of you that are watching that this is actually real work that, that we have to take on. This is nothing that you can do all at once, but there might be one of these reservoirs that are highlighted to you right now that you just spend a little bit of time with. And you ask God, like, God, what is it that's depleting this reservoir? It might just be normal work stuff. It might be more stuff that you can say no to, who knows? And what are some things that you can do to kind of refill these buckets? Now, Rob, let's spend the rest of our time, though, talking about 
um, a practice, one of my favorite in the world. It's a discipline that helps us examine all of these buckets, actually. Like I've sat with this, I've been like, oh my goodness, this is so interesting. This helps us examine it once a week, like once a week. That's so cool that we would have a time that God would give us once a week where we just examine how we're doing. It's one of the most key spiritual practices that I've put in my own life. Um, it's really transformed my family life. It's, it grounds us like body, soul, mind, and, and heart and spirit. Is there anything more? I don't know. There's like more anyways, everything basically. So let's talk about Sabbath for a little bit. And, and what I've asked you to do, I want you to share from the very beginning. I want you to share a picture that God has given you, um, to be able to speak and I've heard it now in a, in a few different settings, but let's go ahead and start there. And then let's talk about the practical realities of how Sabbath works. Sure. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we start in the beginning of the story and in Genesis chapter one, we see this beautiful, poetic, rhythmic uh, picture of God defining and designing the world as it's intended to be, as he desires it to be from a place of joy and goodness. Um, Andy Crouch has done a great job of kind of unpacking Genesis 1 in a creative way and um, kind of drawing from some of the things he's done. He talks about the first three days of Genesis. You know, we hear um, that before even, even God spoke that things were chaotic, there was void, there was emptiness, there was chaos, uh, but the spirit of God was hovering. And in the first three days, as God speaks, um, what happens is he brings order to an undefined space that he uh, certainly brings things to bear in creation and then separates the land and the sea, the stars and the sky, um, and begins to kind of order creation. And then the second half of the six days, uh, he fills that created order with abundance. Uh, he places the vegetation and the animals, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, and it's spoken with such fullness and vitality. It's teeming with life. It's swarming. It's sort of this beautiful dynamic. And then on the sixth day, the culmination is God uh, creates uh, humanity and, and, and invites us into his story. Um, it says he defined all this as very good. He looked about and it was very good. And um, it's a beautiful picture. And Andy Crouch has created this two by two grid, which I want to put up on the screen for us, which kind of helps us think about even connecting back to the video around energy but it's the concept that order and abundance work in cooperation with one another. And this is again, drawn from Andy Crouch's material. So I will take no credit for it, but on the X axis, we see abundance and on the Y axis, we see order. And if we think about this in relationship to the Genesis one, and even what we're talking about in work rest is if we have high abundance, lots of abundance and no order, we have the experience of chaos, the lower right quadrant, uh, things feel overwhelmed. We feel uh, as if there's too much and there's not enough resource or time or, or, or provision for what's, uh, what's in front of us. If we have no abundance and no order, that's sort of nothingness, that's the void. If we have high order, but low spontaneity or no uh, vitality, that's the machine. And that kind of re reflects back to uh, the video you mentioned. But then this quadrant of cosmos, which is the place that God designed, which is filled with life and joy, and it's a pulsating energy. It's the teeming and the swarming. And that's the picture of what was created in the first seven days. And I, I would offer that we could replace the word cosmos as we find humanity in the story with the word flourishing. And so the concept of abundance aligning with order can promote mm -hmm. human flourishing. And so uh, you can pull that off the screen if we'd like. Um, I think what ends up happening is we get stuck as we think about how we participate in uh, finding rhythms that work for us. There's times that we feel again, chaotic, overwhelmed, there's too many things. And we need to understand that we need to increase the order, not rigidity and not even necessarily time management principles, but the things that are the practices, the principles uh, that promote flourishing. And similarly, mm -hmm. sometimes we're so rigid. I'm sure some of us have had seasons where we've just defined our calendar mm -hmm. as the end all be all to the life we're gonna live, but mm -hmm. we, we lose life in that. It doesn't have spontaneity, it doesn't have vitality. It doesn't have kind of the pulsating of the energy that gives us the ability to say yes, even to good things that might come our way. Um, and the culmination of the seven days is that Sabbath practice that God rests. He sees everything as good and he chooses to rest. And, you know, it's from this place that we begin to ask, am I experiencing abundance that requires me to consider order? Or am I so ordered that I'm eliminating some abundance? And how do I allow the two things to work together 
to bring this sense of human flourishing, the kind of shalom of creation, all things mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. me with the world, me with God, the world mm -hmm. with me, you know, uh, all the different dynamics. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting because as we pull that concept of order and the importance of order, Jesus in the New Testament gives us kind of the same framework to think that order actually is important. And, you know, he's asked what's most important, uh, what really matters, what does this all boil down to? And he says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Be connected, be focused, be energized, be aligned with the things that matter. And then he says, seek first the kingdom of God, and these things will matter. So he orders our life in the invitation to, to be a part of his kingdom. And um, that includes the practice of Sabbath. And I think this concept of kingdom as kingdom people, those who are watching or connected to the vineyard or part of the vineyard movement, we would sometimes refer to ourselves as kingdom people. At some level in the conversation, we have to understand at the beginning, we're talking about God's good governance, God ordering our lives in a way that brings about flourishing mm -hmm. and his intention, our willful, joyful submission to the governance of God in our mm -hmm. practical everyday living, which includes the Sabbath that shows up in the Old Testament and shows up in the New Testament, shows up in Hebrews as Jesus being the fulfillment of the rest offered by God. I love this quote that comes from Walter Brueggemann, who has written a book called Sabbath mm -hmm. as Resistance. Mm -hmm. And he says, the narrative says that wherever God governs as an alternative, the restfulness of God counters the restless anxiety of the world. And so yes. when we're governed by God, it's that restfulness that we should experience. And that Sabbath practice mm -hmm. is the earliest picture of what it looks like to cooperate. We mm -hmm. see it in the Exodus. We see it again in the Old Testament practices, a picture of saying no to the hurriedness of culture mm -hmm. that we might say yes to the governance of God's provision yeah. and his abundance. And I think the Sabbath practice uh, is the, is kind of is the agreement with God's good reign and rule. The practice of yes. Sabbath is in agreement with God's good reign and rule. Yes. I'll tell you what, I mean, that is the very first book that I ever read about Sabbath. It's, it's so, so good. good. It is so good. The part of, and I just want to reemphasize something that you just said, the part of, this has been designed from the very beginning of time, but over the course of time, people forgot. The Israelites forgot. This was so critically important to their well-being, their flourishing. And uh, when the commandments came down, and Moses was to deliver that is because he's looking at a people that were still living in the same way that they were living when they were oppressed, when they were being beaten, when they had tasks and they had no joy. And he's reminding them once again in a commandment, how critically important the Sabbath rest is. Um, I also enjoy, um, I, I just recently was reading that even when we talk, or we talk about that Genesis story um, of, of rest, it really does mean ceasing. It means mm -hmm. stopping work um, because God actually, he doesn't sleep. He doesn't really even necessarily rest, but what he's showing us in that moment that he was ceasing work, mm -hmm. which is no small concept. Um, so let's talk about Sabbath for a moment because for me, when I started to explore this and I'm reading, you know, I started off with Brueggemann's book. Um, there's a lot of great, there's a lot of great books out there that we can definitely recommend later just to even start the journey, especially if it's somebody, if somebody is watching this and they've never tried anything before, I would also assume that there's people that are trying, that are genuinely trying this and they're trying to figure out how to lead out in a community, like a Sabbath community, like whether they're leading their church or a small group, or their ministry. Um, I remember for me, and I want to talk very practically about this. Um, when I when I heard, and I started to think about this just for myself, because I had to really rein in, like wanting my whole family to be involved at first. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and maybe that's just my crazy little family, but I just knew that I had to. The Lord was speaking to me specifically about Sabbath for myself. Um, the key kind of like ingredients of Sabbath of delight and of worship and of rest and kind of a reflection was very key for me. It helped me because it wasn't just crowding activity into my Sabbath, but it was giving me a framework for the way that that day should look. Um, and there's so much creativity in that, isn't there, Rob? Absolutely. With thinking about um, those ingredients. Yeah, I think, I think the framework of rest, worship, and delight 
mm-hmm. is an empowering mm-hmm. framework to understand and even invite us to ask mm-hmm. questions because what mm-hmm. what is rest for one person is not necessarily rest for another person. Exactly. exactly. Re- restfulness can be watching a movie. It can be reading a book. It can be taking a nap. It can be working out. I mean, there can be moments in which our rest is engaged in the things that we need. Same with delight and worship. What what fills us, what fills the reservoir is not going to be unilaterally the same for each one of us. And I think the picture of, of giving people freedom to ask the questions, how do I rest? What is restful? What is worship for me? How am I most connected to the Lord? And what do I delight in? And how do I fill my time with one with those three activities in such a way that they actually do recharge yeah. me, not just feel like an added weight to my, uh, you know, to what I have to carry yeah. in my obligations to God or to being a good leader or to my family. So if that is, um, I, I think that this is actually a really good practice. Um, again, a little bit of a homework assignment for those that are listening to take those three categories and take them to Jesus, go to take a walk go somewhere and start to ask God to speak to you about those three categories and the way that he has designed you, the way that he's made you, um, the way that your life looks at, like right now. Um, I do want to acknowledge that different seasons of life and in, in, in periodical like examinations of the things that the Lord is speaking to you about, like currently, like right now, you need to have them. You need to have spaces where you can go back and go, oh yeah, actually now I have a kid and every little bit of time is not mine right now. You know, like we need to have real moments like that. Or I've talked with people that have great rhythms and then some type of crisis hits and they have to re-examine what that is for them, uh, what Sabbath actually looks like for them. Because when crisis hits and you're in the midst of grief or loss, um, you might need different things. Actually, I would say that you do need different things, kind of working within that Sabbath life. Um, agree? I mean, haven't you seen that in your own life with different seasons, different stages? Honestly, we get tired as we get older, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah, which, which for me, yeah. The initial step for this was actually a kind of shifting of my understanding of my personal agency in relationship to Sabbath and its importance. Okay. So for me, the agency sounded at some point probably like I could never take a full day off or I can't imagine taking a full day off, which is a, a passive sense of agency. And I began to actually have a discipline where I would say instead of I can't or I won't, I would use the phrase I won't, I won't take a day off or I won't practice because it allowed me to be confronted with my own sense of not having limitations, right? Of not knowing how to define my limitations. And then saying that phrase out loud, I won't take a day off, turn the mirror on myself in such a way that I had to decide that no, I, I, I will take time. I will commit to finding the rhythms creatively. Um, I, I don't know about you, Danielle, but our Sabbath practice is not the, the kind of sit, the typical Shabbat, you know, Friday night sundown to, to Saturday night sundown. Uh, our experience has been, we've had to, we've had to commit to Sabbath and then move Sabbath around based on the demands of our calendar, of our schedule, of, of various things that are very different for contemporary Western American lifestyle, as opposed to, but to commit to a, a, a full day of rest with constancy, even if it shifts occasionally with a constant commitment mm-hmm. has been about agency as much as it's been about, uh, it's been about agency more than it's been about time management. And that was the first shift for me to decide I can actually disappoint some people. I can let some obligations or commitments uh, hear a no where they might historically have heard a yes. Um, I can make space for this critically important, restful Um, because here's what's interesting. I've been in uh, kind of athletics for my whole life. I grew up and the idea that's compelling Mm -hmm. to me about that video is the idea of increasing Mm -hmm. our capacity to, Mm -hmm. to, to flourish, to grow Mm -hmm. in our ability to do all of the things that are before us as abundance increases opportunities, um, potential uh, responsibilities, relationships, Mm -hmm. as that increases, if our order also increases Mm -hmm. in a way that matches the rest recovery cycle, we can actually do more in a given week than if we are rigid with committing to a certain set of hours or block scheduling or, um, and so I'm, I'm compelled by that power of engagement video that I can increase my capacity by building in the right rhythms that nourish and refill those reservoirs, which I think is a beautiful way to think about it, uh, in relationship to the spiritual practice of Sabbath. 
Well, it really is. And that's why I wanted to spend the first portion of this time together talking about work. Work is good. Work is incredible. I mean, we have been called to be able to um, work in the kingdom and this world and our neighborhoods. We need to be able to do that well. And honestly, I have very rarely met a lazy person. Like if anything, I mean, I, I do think that that's at the heart of a person, like where they actually do want meaningful engagement in this world in their role and what they do and their calling. So I do think that that's really critically important. And the concept that you're talking about, about pulling back hard, which would be what the authors of that book advocate for. Um, it's really interesting because they do a lot of work within athletics um, professionally. And that's kind of how they started off doing this. And they said, athletes weren't resting enough, the ones that they were mm -hmm. kind of tasked to be able to help and say, get, get, get better. You know, like we need to hire you because we need to, you need these athletes to get better. These authors that were tasked with that were like, actually, we need them to pull back even harder with the way mm -hmm. that they rest for the sake of their body, their minds, their energy. I mean, like all sorts of stuff. Um, that was very big. And that immediately made me start thinking about the ceasing that we are commanded to do from the very beginning of time, we have to cease. We have to cease. We have to stop. And that is hard. That is very hard. That means very practically putting computers away, putting, um, you know, the different kind of, what is, what is it called? Like the, the, the little messages that come up and just say, I'm not going to engage this for, for a day. It means putting your phone away. That's actually very hard for our family. Like I, I think that the technology piece is something that can get very, very tricky. Actually, it is very tricky. It needs constant communication and talking about because we have so much at our, so much that we can access. Um, and that immediately disrupts any type of rhythm of rest that you might have, right? Isn't it kind of like yeah. a wormhole? It's a little bit Absolutely. of a wormhole. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and that's where, again, as I went back to earlier, like the concept of guiding principles, like there have to be some things that I can tell myself yes. are true for me and about me that then allow me to speak against the temptation to reach for my phone or to answer a phone call or respond to someone's urgency with a, uh, with a, to their felt need and being okay with recognizing that there are going to be different moments where the practices of Sabbath and their constraints actually do cause people and potentially uh, they cause disappointment in a system that is asking for more and more and more all the time. Um, yes. And this is a bit more of a lifestyle of practice than it is simply yes. a, an activity. Um, Sabbath and a Sabbath lifestyle gives you a week that is six days of work, a seventh day of rest. And again, that that language we have to kind of make sense for, for how we think about uh, a work week within um, our Fridays are a day off from the church historically, but they were our family work day. So that was when we mm -hmm. got all of our chores done, the grocery store, the laundry, you know, doing the lawn so that we could Sabbath on Saturday. Um, and for us, that meant actually not, it meant shaping the church calendar accordingly, um, which has always come at a challenge because the rhythms of vocational ministry and the rhythms of the people in your church don't always align such that you can uh, think about implementing Sabbath as a cultural experience that lets your people see that rest is important for them as well. Okay, so let's talk about that just for a moment. And then I wanna go ahead and just put a resource in everybody's hands. Um, let's talk very specifically about um, something that we're seeing, Rob, over the last year is that the Vineyard has a very high percentage of bivocational mm -hmm. pastors. And what you're even talking about just a minute ago about there actually has to be a little bit of prep for Sabbath because how do we get all the things done so that we can just really relax? Like my mountain of laundry in my house is like Mount Everest, right? Like it just, <laughs> it can collect over the course of the week and we need moments where we can grocery shop and put the laundry away and whatever. I mean, just to really rest. Cause I know that I cannot do that. I am, it is not my, it is not my strong point to be able to stop everything. Um, but what, how, how would, how would we talk to somebody that literally is in a position of having maybe two, three jobs, um, they're kind of caught to where they might not have a lot of that prep time that they need to be able to engage in a full day of rest. Um, because I felt like what you said a minute ago is really important. The agency piece, you know, instead of like, I can't, I won't, but how does that, how does that work into somebody that's really caught in a life situation 
um, to where they really don't have a lot of time. Well, I think that boils back ultimately to the question of flourishing as opposed to time management. So I think when we have time management, we're looking at a long list of things to get done and we look at a limited amount of time and we decide I have to accomplish this much in a short period of time. Uh, and how do I, amp how do I, how do I try to find more time in the day? You know, that's a phrase yes. that's all I say. If I had one, if I had one extra hour a day, 25 hours in a day, it would be so much more helpful. Would it? I, I don't know if that would. I think what we're, I think what we're talking <laughs> about, and I think where, you know, the book Sabbath as resistance is compelling is there's actually a practice of God's people to resist, you know, effectively we kind of look to Romans 12, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. Mm -hmm. So there is a reality that the world is going to draw us into anxious, hurried, busyness, scarcity, a thought of never enough, not enough. Um, and I think we have to, to rest in what God speaks to, towards our flourishing is by his design the best for us. Now, the grace to bivocational pastors is creativity. Um, I've actually uh, been what I refer to as co-vocational. I've had sort of little side hustles alongside of most of my vocational ministry for, for almost all 20 years of doing pastoral ministry. And I've just had to be very, very creative and be willing to say no uh, it, within the convictions of my of, of this principle. Um, and so creativity, I think, is the grace of the Lord, right? And asking the questions, how do I rest? How do I worship? How do I delight? Empowers me to think about how do I build that into a, a reasonable uh, week schedule so that Sabbath can be creative. Um, the thing I've experienced is people who begin to rest learn that they are they are actually served well by rest. And so as we begin to create habits of rest, we'll actually you know most of the things that are good in the kingdom kind of beget more. So generosity begets generosity. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness begets forgiveness. I think rest begets rest. I think once we realize God mm -hmm. has given us rest for our benefit, we will seek out ways to be creatively restful, yes. um, even, even when our schedules are complicated. Yes. Amen and amen. Um, let me go ahead and just end with this um, because our time is running out. And again, if you want to stay on, we've got a couple more questions that we can address. Um, uh, probably one of the the, the most um, popular, maybe common things that people are writing me about in my, my role on the national team is what about sabbaticals? And I just want to say one line about sabbaticals um, because there are some uh, really incredible things that we can do to start to think about more extended rest. You have to start with Sabbath first. I mean, just to be able to even experience what that's like for a day. I know so many people are so tired that they just are dreaming about maybe having a little bit longer of a time, but they don't even know how that actually works within a week. So I do highly recommend start with Sabbath first, see if you can kind of alleviate some of that exhaustion, some tiredness, and then start planning and thinking and praying and discerning about a sabbatical. Um, for vineyard pastors up until the end of the year, I have a sabbatical resource that we are letting people know about that they can just quickly download. It involves coaching and some short videos to kind of think a little bit more about your sabbatical time. Um, a PDF of a work workbook that you can sit and kind of write through with a, you know a, a few of your thoughts. So that definitely is a resource. And then for for continued learning about the things that we're talking about today, this book right here just came out a couple of days ago. It is by Ruth Haley Barton. I've already read it. It is so good. Um, it's called Embracing Rhythms of Work and Rest, and this specifically does talk about Sabbath. And it also addresses sabbaticals. So five lucky kind of viewers that hopped on today are going to get this sent to them in the mail. Um, I'll reach out to you. It's completely um, random why we chose your name or how we chose your name. But we will definitely put a link to this book after so that you can buy that if you want to, if you do not get that um, for free with our five. So I just want to say thank you as we wrap up our time. Um, I would love to go ahead and just end by a prayer for us. And again, just say thank you for our time. And I gave you a little bit of homework to start working on, to sit with Jesus with. Um, and I really do trust that he will speak to you in this. I think this is something to bring to him, even if it's a, how can I even start doing this to bring to him? And I think that he will speak to you. So let me go ahead and just end by a short prayer. Lord, we are grateful for this time together. Again, we trust that you speak, that you love us that you really do love to engage in this conversation. 
of how we work well with everything in our being, but then also how we rest well, how we stay submitted to um, this ultimate kind of design for the way that we've been created. So Lord, we, we are grateful for this gift and we really do want to become leaders and pastors that live out of the overflow of what you are doing in our lives. So we thank you and we're grateful in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. So if you want to hang around just for a few minutes, um, Rob, there are a few common questions that we did not get to that hopefully you can kind of engage just a few more minutes on. Um, let's talk about, let's, let's talk very, or actually, do you have anything that you want to start with? Uh, I had a question that came towards me and, okay. and I'm happy to say somebody had asked about, um, cause I think I alluded to, for me, one of the things that helps me rest is actually physically activity, physical activity, okay. um, as part of my Sabbath practice. Uh, and they were curious, how does working out count as rest? Um, and mm -hmm. I think, again, this is the learning process and maybe, uh, yeah. maybe there's, there's grace for us to disagree if, if we would want to, but I think as we learn how our bodies are made, how we release stress, mm -hmm. how anxiety impacts us. Um, and Michael Gatlin, I, I remember hearing him say, if you work with your mind, rest with your hands. If you work with your hands, rest with your mind. So there are certain ways that maybe, and maybe that's not an edict or a mandate, but if I'm, if I'm someone who's in my head a lot, I'm on the computer, I'm staring at a screen, I'm reading, um, mm -hmm. being practical, being engaged, knitting, gardening, uh, you know, kind of tactile experiences. Um, uh, maybe there's craftsmanship that can be a part of the process. It's not to produce a thing. It's to partner with the craftsman, kind of the quality of God who is a creator. Same thing, if you work with your hands, how do you mm -hmm. rest with your mind, reading a book or relaxing or reflecting, journaling, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So I've just learned that I do quite a bit of work in my brain, uh, lots of thinking, lots of communicating, uh, and this, the, the physical stress of that works itself out um, as mm -hmm. I have some opportunities to release in physical activity. Okay. I love that. I love that way of thinking. Um, let's talk real quick about community and how community relates to this practice of Sabbath. Um, Sabbath was always meant, it was designed to be able to be a part of a community. It doesn't mean that you don't start it as an individual practice, um, but to have that forethought of how does this work within my family life, which let's talk about that first. And then also within our church world, our spiritual community. And then we have another layer of leadership as well. Like how do we actually lead our folks to be able to do that? Um, that almost feels to me like a whole nother conversation. <laughs> it feels like a much deeper, I don't know, but, but let's talk about family real quick, because I know that for me, I mentioned a minute ago, this really did have to start with my own practice before I engaged with it, with my husband, I've got two teenage girls. Um, one of the things and, uh, that I really had to do was lower a lot of expectation, not in a demeaning way to my loved ones, but, but again, to allow them to be able to figure out what this looks like for them, for themselves. Um, the one thing that we did agree on, because like, for instance, my husband and I, anybody that knows us, we're very, very different. We have different things that appeal to us that fill us up. I mean, that sort of thing. Um, so there was like a stepping back of controlling the way that he was engaging with Sabbath. The one thing that worked for us, especially having teenage daughters, was to agree on at least coming together for a family meal to where we could come together, put everything down. Um, you know, it's oftentimes we have sports on Saturdays. We, we celebrate Sabbath from like a Friday night to a Saturday night um, before we go into church life on Sunday. Um, but we started the rhythm and the practice of having a family meal together. And, you know, we, 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 we make, you know, I have to prepare ahead of time, get all the ingredients, but we sit there, we make pasta together because we had this glorious trip to Italy, like a few years back to where we were like, we can do this. This is simple. This is good. And again, it was like this, um, kind of working with our hands and talking and having this lingering process, but that's been something that's been incredibly beautiful for our family, even if we might not get everything right on this, right? Even if, even if, you know, I watch them kind of disappear to their rooms and they're still trying to figure that out, like what that looks like for them. What's that look like for you and your own family? 
I would say it's similar. You know, it's sort of the development of family rituals, which again, rituals of yes. exercise, with, with rituals of rest, and what yes. are our rituals of rest? I would say one of the most impactful for our whole family to embrace the, the the Sabbath experience and the rhythm of rest is we've just taken long walks as a family. We've made a habit yeah. of trying to yeah. find, uh, you know, the all the metro parks and, and nature preserves in the Columbus area and explore a different one each time. Um, our Saturday rhythm has typically been very slow in the morning and the kind of the, the ritual of you, you have kind of until noon to do whatever you want. So I enjoy uh, Premier League soccer. And so it's usually up on, and on early mm -hmm. on Saturday mornings. So I'm actually awake at seven, usually on Saturday, which is Sabbath, which feels to some people again, odd, uh, but I delight in mm -hmm. sports and specifically in Premier League soccer. And so I will watch a soccer game before most mm -hmm. of the family is active. Um, and so you just, I think it's creating some rituals that are predictable and inviting yes. participation. My dear friend, um, who's also a pastor on our staff who has much younger children, um, she had to really think through this because the family rituals look very different, especially when you have like a two-year-old. Gosh. Um, and right, right. Yeah. So they, they started making a ritual around a special dessert, like throughout mm. their day. And so the kids get to plan it throughout the week. Like, what are we going to make together? And then they have a special time where they walk to the park, they come back, you know? And so it's a very yeah. simple thing, but it's one of those things where my friend, um, told me recently that when you get to the point where your where your family or your little ones start to expect it or start to plan on it or get really excited about it that's when you're like winning okay winning it might not be the most spiritual thing that you're doing with your family i believe it is actually but let's go ahead and redefine what that even looks like i think that god is very pleased by those family rituals when he sees families sitting together now i do want to speak to single people as well because this has been something that we've really thought through in our church life or at least started to talk about um, it can be very lonely when you start think, talking about the Sabbath and community. And so for, if you do not have, if you're not married or have kids to start to think through what this looks like with a roommate or with friends to have a communal meal or some type of activity that you're doing together to where you can get a little bit of that sense of community as well. Yeah. 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 My um, experience, and this wasn't so much about Sabbath, but I remember being a parent of a four-year-old and a one-year-old living in a hundred year old farmhouse that creaked. And so as soon as somebody got up, you know, the whole family got up and I remember, you know, doing a, a kind of devotional routine in the mornings. And at one point I'd get up at, you know, whatever time it was. And I'd walk downstairs and the stairs would creak. And shortly after my four-year-old <laughs> would get out of bed and she would come and I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to do all the, 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 the highly religious, I'm doing my Bible study, I'm writing, I'm journaling, I'm doing all this stuff. And she would come and she would sit down. And honestly, for the first number of times I was like, Oh my gosh, when am I ever going to have time? And then she would actually start to, she would see me with my Bible and she started to bring her kids Bible. And so I'm reading quietly. And then she's asking daddy, what's you reading? You know, all these sorts of things. And at some point I just sat with the Lord and he said, have your quiet time with her. So for probably two years, I did my morning devotion with the kids Bible with my daughter on her lap together. And it was, if, if, if flourishing is engagement and connection, loving your neighbor as yourself as a prior, like I'm sitting with my child in front of the word of God. And I just remembered thinking for a while, I felt it was inconvenient that my child was interrupting my devotional experience and God just had to reframe it and say, you have a yeah. chance to invite your child into a habit with the scriptures that may serve them for the rest of their lives. So I, I do think, especially for parents of young children to think incredibly yeah. creatively and realize that what is restful for your children can be restful for your family um, rituals that are enjoyable. Uh, the idea of doing nothing is probably not uh, a concept that makes a ton of sense for families of young children. And then the, the output of being a mom or a dad is, is very real. And so how can you partner with your spouse or partner within your community to find mm -hmm. other options uh, to, to maybe have longer drinks of rest a weekend away um, a yes. silent retreat that can fill, you know, those reservoirs. Um, if yes. you can't have the same sort of a, a full 24 hours because of the responsibilities as a mom or dad. Yes. Basically we're saying examine your life on some type of rhythm where yeah. you can see like what's working. Right. And don't give up. I would just say, don't, don't, don't give up. And there is such a beauty and a grace with what we're talking about. I believe that the Lord genuinely is pleased 
mm-hmm. with us trying. I, I yeah. really, really do. Now, as I, I want to kind of end with this, um, as we are considering what we do for a living, we are pastors, we are leaders, um, we lead people. Um, how, how do we, let's just talk for just a few minutes, like how do we take this individual practice or something that's happening within like a, a smaller context and how do we actually lead out of that? Um, I, I know that this has been a very slow process. This is something that you can't just like, I don't know. I mean, maybe if you start a church actually thinking this way, this is actually probably your best bet. But for somebody that's in a little bit more of an established kind of community, this is not something that you've talked about before. Maybe you have a few staff members, like where would you suggest that you start with this, with actually bringing this to the people of God that he has called you to be able to lead? What have you done in your own context? And again, let me run right yeah. that. We are not experts. We are just <laughs> trying things, right? Like we're just trying. Yes. We're just, yes. you know, and, and I've got some very funny stories about this, like with even our own, our own kind of local context. But what's yeah. that look like for you? Give me like maybe one story. I mean, uh, it's, I, well, the one story is outside of uh, a weekend retreat or a weekend intensive that we offer four times a year, our church for the most part does nothing on Saturdays. Um, which I know for uh, for churches, especially smaller churches, okay. is usually prime, prime real estate for when you're going to run a training or a, a newcomer thing because you're getting people on their day off. Yeah. If I'm honest, Danielle, I think our job is to model a countercultural existence. Yeah. And I think for our people, our job is to be courageously prophetic. And if yes. prophetic is to live differently in relationship to the demands of the culture, then we have to be okay with modeling that and allowing other people to interpret that through their own lens and participate in ways that will come from their own convictions. Um, So, so one of our guiding principles as a community is to be courageously prophetic, which allows us to say, how is God speaking into the world? And will we make courageous decisions around that? Mm -hmm. And for us, the Sabbath practice has been a communal decision to not over schedule uh, Mm -hmm. our, our, our Saturdays in particular. And I'm Mm -hmm. sure there is impact that Mm -hmm. is empirically negative for the way some things could happen in our church. Uh, I like by evaluation, by assessment. I would say somebody says, well, when does the training happen? Or if it only happens on Thursday nights, then you're missing a whole crew of people who could come on Saturdays. You're 100% oh, correct, see. right? Yeah. That, that, is, that is 100% correct. But is the value of obedience to the Lord being modeled in such a way that it invites people to ask questions for themselves as well? So I, I don't, yeah. I think, I think starting with your staff, having conversations around personal Sabbath mm-hmm. practices, building rhythms that allow the church to rest, knowing the mm-hmm. liturgical calendar of your, of your city and what are the seasons of rest. And so, um, you know, all of those things can be a part of the process mm-hmm. of building a culture that is honoring um, the invitation to rest. And then as, mm-hmm. as, as, you know, we, we can or desire, uh, you know, incorporating a, a Sabbath practice in our communities. Yeah. When I was taking my individual practice um, to my family and then, and then we started praying about what would this look like for our leaders? I, I would genuinely advise, like you start in small spaces um, because you have to get your leaders on board with this. Like you have to get them actually practicing themselves. Um, I will never forget the couple kind of longer meetings that we had with some of our pastoral staff um, where we were talking about kind of committing to each other that we were going to start to practice this and the stories that came out. I mean, we had a couple of staff members that had real trauma around mm. thinking about Sabbath based on their own story growing up. And that's mm. a real thing, I think, to acknowledge that maybe some people grew up in families like where this is very harsh. It was very, um, legalistic. Um, it was never fun you know, especially as a little kid, you're like, oh my God, that, you know, there was one, one woman that, you know, I mean, she just literally had to stay in her room all day. I mean, like, so, so there was great confession in that staff time together, great confession. There was a lot of wondering, there was a lot of like, I don't even know how to do that, you know? And, and so we just committed to each other, um, that we would start to weekly just talk about it and say, how is this working? It got to the point like where, Um, and we started off slow. We started off, let's just try half a day. Let's just kind of dip our toes in, just see how this works. You know, now the, the, the perfectionist in in me, was just like, no, we need the full thing. God (laughs) gave us 24 hours, you know, but, but I did feel like he was just like, okay, just let folks try this on. 
And what's interesting is that over the course of time, you could see some of our leaders, they went to their leaders, the people that they were pastoring and they said, okay, let's try this together. And it started to kind of leak out to our elders, our small group leaders. Um, We started to use the word Sabbath a little bit more from a stage and from the front so that, you know, I'm thinking about even you talking about not doing things on Saturdays, or maybe it's a Sunday for people like Mm -hmm. But, but, but actually connecting that to like why we're choosing to do something like that and actually calling it Sabbath. Like, it's not just something that, you know, it just happens to be like, we're actually intentionally thinking through this. Um, and it's been a great joy to watch that kind of lead its way through our church um, to where you can see now just families that just attend or come, they're kind of picking up a little bit more on that culture and that ethos been trying to create so a long a long way to go a long way to go and we keep revisiting how's this working and you know and I'll, I'll look at some of our staff I'm like okay you've told us now three weeks in a row that you have not done it like what's going on here and doesn't your body even start to feel the lack of that and sure enough they're like yes I I feel it I desire it I need it back in my life so um there's great potential I just want to end with this like there's great potential for leading um, very intentionally. And, and we need this, we need churches and communities that feel very convicted about this. We really do. So we're out of time. I just want to bless you guys. Um, Thank you for joining us for this hour and 15 minutes. Hopefully this is really helpful for you. We're going to be putting this up on our website so that you can access this, especially if you want somebody else to go ahead and watch this. Um, Reach out if you have any questions and I'm excited. The Vineyard, we're going to keep doing these webinars. Every quarter, we're going to, we're going to do some, some more of them. This is our first one. So do you think it went well, Rob? I think it went wonderfully well. You did an amazing job. <laughs> I think you really did. I, I'm, I'm inspired. I'm inspired. I'm inspired to ask some of the questions that you've challenged all of us to ask. Good. So you did great. Good. This is wonderful. We're all learning together. 